Alrighty, well, welcome back to our class and our last class in the series on the sacrifice of Christ in the Old and New Testaments. <coughs> <coughs> Tonight, you will see we'll be going over kind of a review and some concluding thoughts. Since here's my conglomerate of all my introduction pictures from the class from burnt offerings to peace offerings to sin offerings to meat offerings all the way through the New Testament. Kind of to, to review, the first offering we talked about was the burnt offering, but there were a few things that were common to all the offerings. Uh, first off, they had to be without blemish or imperfections. That was a requirement throughout the sacrifices. And then throughout each of them as well, nothing was to be wasted. None of the blood was to be wasted. All the blood was to be shed. We saw even when the, a bird was offered, they would ring its head off so they wouldn't waste any blood from the bird. You know, Christ was without blemish or, or spot. With, he was perfectly sinless. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 9, or one nineteen tells us, as well as 2.22, uh, Hebrews 4.15, all describe him as without blemish, without spot, or without sin. Because he completely fulfilled that requirement of the sacrifices. Now, he shed all his blood during the crucifixion. I think that was very plain by the piercing of his side in John 19.34 when out gushed the water and the blood. Between his sufferings beforehand and his death on the cross, he had shed probably every last drop of blood that was in him. I said, see also Hebrews 9.12, I don't think any of his blood was wasted because it was shed for us. It was for a particular people. It wasn't just thrown out there and hopefully it covers. <laughs> like I said, the burnt offering was the first one we looked at. Now, this was described as a voluntary offering and it was completely consumed on the altar. It signified complete dedication to God and complete so it can be completely given to God, if you will. As I mentioned when we were looking through the crucifixion, Christ from his first recorded words in the scriptures to his <coughs> last before he gave up the ghost was, you know, I must be about my father's business and father into my hands I commend my spirit, indicating how he was completely given to the father throughout his life and even in death. So he was completely consumed, if you will, used up on the cross. He was his strength was dried up, scriptures say. Physically speaking, he was as used up as one could be. And he willingly gave up his life. John ten, seventeen through eighteen tells us that no man takes his life, but he laid it down willingly, he could take it up just the same. They were responsible for killing Christ, but he was the one who willingly laid down his life for us. <laughs> the next offering was the meat offering, which the drink offering went along with that. This offering was a memorial. It was the only one that was offered without an animal sacrifice. This one, if you recall, had fine flour, which indicated there was no imperfections in it, frankincense, and oil. Frankincense being for a good smelling savor to God and oil is always a type of the Holy Spirit in the scriptures. You know, no leaven or honey was to be used in this sacrifice. In fact, specifically none was to be burnt upon the altar. And this I believe signifies how his body was broken and his blood was poured out for us. For drink offering was poured out. You know, it's sometimes called a Oblate or <coughs> excuse me, uh, oh, I forgot the word now. The <laughs> in the meat offering, there were several provisions, but one of them in particular was they were to take this and to break the bread and to cast it upon the fire. You know, I think we had the same type in the Lord's Supper. It's called a remembrance or a, a memorial just as the meat offering was that we are to remember what Christ did for us uh, Luke 22 19 through 20 put that very plainly you know, this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me 
This is my blood which is shed for you, this do in remembrance of me. Ephesians 5, 2 describes his sacrifice as a sweet-smelling savor to God. It was pleasing to God, if you will. And very obviously the Spirit was upon him. Luke 3, 22, as well as 4, 18, describe how the Spirit descended like a dove when he was baptized. And this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then he proclaims himself that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. <clears throat> but the no leaven and no honey like we mentioned seem to indicate there was no th pleasantness if you will in his death and certainly his form of execution was not pleasant crucifixion well, I was reading more upon just the sufferings that go along with crucifixion and how that <laughs> obviously you're nailed to a cross that alone seems painful enough but then as you're as the person is pushing up to try to breathe because asphyxiation is how most die on the from crucifixion from being crushed and their lungs filling with their blood and fluids they would push themselves up to try to get a breath that's why the they came by and broke the bones of the, or the legs of the other two, so they would die a little quicker. Christ already being dead, that scriptures might be fulfilled, a bone would not be broken. But one person had said that <clears throat> well, as you're pushing up and then the, your whole weight of your body is coming down, it's literally ripping your elbows and shoulders and everything out of joint, which it was prophesied of Christ that all his bones were out of joint. There was no, certainly nothing pleasant in the death of Christ. Right. Well, I see Stephen, one of the first martyrs, he, he was stoned, but yet he seemed to go very peacefully, didn't he? So the Lord caused him to go to sleep. <clears throat> I personally believe Stephen was... The uh, Lord went ahead and took him out of here before the stones did, but, but there was nothing <coughs> like that in... With Christ, he had to endure every last pain, every last suffering, both physically as well as spiritually. Then there was the peace offering. <clears throat> this was the only one in which the offerer ate a part of the sacrifice. Now this particular offering seemed to indicate first peace with God, and with that comes fellowship with God. If you recall, there was a fellowship meal made at this offering. You know, certainly Christ is our peace, Ephesians 2.14. Romans 5.1 tells us that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. As we mentioned, 1 Corinthians 5.18 tells us that we've been reconciled with God. That means we've been brought back into agreement or back into fellowship with Him. You know, it's through Christ that we have fellowship with God once again. That we have peace with God, that we're in agreement, if you will. We're no longer at enmity with God. Certainly Christ is a perfect fulfillment, if you will, of this peace offering. And then we had the sin offering. And this was a required offering because sin had to be dealt with. <laughs> so this, if you recall, the blood was offered upon the altar. But the rest was burnt, as it said, without the camp or outside of the camp. It was taken out side of Israel and where they poured out the ashes, it said, and they burnt the rest of the sacrifice there. Well, this indicated atonement for sins individually, particularly, and really a cleansing us from sin. Christ shed his blood for us, for the remission of sins, Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Christ was offered for our sins, Hebrews 9.28, Hebrews 10.12, 1 Peter 2.24 all indicate that. 1 John 1 and 7 and verse 9 tell us that his blood cleanses us from all sin. Right. And as I pointed out in Hebrews last week, Hebrews 13.12, he suffered without the gate, he suffered outside of Jerusalem fulfilling even that requirement of without the camp. Right. Certainly Christ has cleansed us from all sin, as 
John writes, he cleanses he has cleansed us not only from you know, the sins we committed before we were saved, also the ones after we were saved, and all the ones that we will in the future. You know, the ones we recognize and the ones we don't even recognize. Christ has cleansed us from those things. You know, it's not as the Roman Catholics teach and some might have to go to purgatory to <laughs> to expiate their sins, if you will, to, to pay for those sins that they didn't have covered while they were living. Oh, Christ paid it all, as the scripture says, or as the song says, I mean. And then lastly, we had the trespass offering. You know, this was also a required offering. This was, one thing to note was this did not, excuse me, this was never described as a sweet-smelling savor. You know, there's a few conjectures, if you will, on why that is. Uh, I think one is because the guilt of sin being placed upon Christ was not necessarily something that was pleasing. It was pleasing to God, but it wasn't a, a pleasing act, if you will. I don't know how to word that in a different way. God himself had to turn his back upon Christ when he became sin for us. Right. Matthew 27, 45 through 46 tell us that when Christ cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, he was left completely alone there if you will darkness was upon the face of the earth for the space of about three hours another thing that was interesting about the trespass offering was that it was even for the poorest of poor provision was made right. so if you couldn't afford a lamb you could offer two turtle doves if you couldn't afford that you could even offer some fine flour Christ is, for lack of a better way of putting it, accessible to all that would come to him. Sure. John six thirty seven. Christ said, I, Him that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. Now, we could get on to uh, who will come to Christ, but that's a different topic. But you can be sure that any that truly come to Christ, he will not cast out. You know, it doesn't matter if you're the poorest of poor, or the richest of rich, or the, the chief of sinners. Or whether you thought yourself to be a good person, yet all that come to Christ for saving faith, He will receive, if you will. Right. Said so this indicates atonement for the guilt of sin, if you will, or the making the payment for sin. Not only Christ covered our sins individually, He covered even our guilt of our sin. We were justified. So the scripture or the New Testament uses. Through Christ, Romans three twenty four, we are now justified through Him. Romans eight one says, therefore there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. In Christ, we are declared innocent, if you will. The guilt of sin has been removed from us. Now, I don't think that gives us you know, free license to sin, free license to do whatever, and then say, well, I've been covered by the blood, but no. We are not guilty when we stand before God. If we've been saved by the, the grace of God, if His blood has been applied, if you will, if we have. Not only did He remove our sins, He removed even our guiltiness. And obviously, He paid our debt. Romans six twenty three for the way to sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right. You know, Titus two fourteen that He <coughs> we say He redeemed us. With his own blood, you know, we say that he might re redeem unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. I would like to look at a couple scriptures tonight. Uh, let's go with Ro or excuse me, Acts chapter twenty-six. Acts twenty-six, verse twenty-two and twenty-three. Here, Paul is uh, speaking to King Agrippa. And Pestis also was there. Acts 26, verse 22 says, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and sh 
should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So even Paul said he could point to Christ in the Old Testament. You know, really, our message should be the same Christ crucified and resurrected. <laughs> he can, well, from Genesis even all the way through the New Testament, we can preach Christ. There are some that want to discount the Old Testament, but yet Paul and the apostles, that's really what they used to point to Christ. As he says here, he said, it's saying none other things than which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That's how he was going to convince the Jews was by going to the Old Testament. <laughs> and that's what he did over and over again. Peter as well. But the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament pointed that Christ was coming. He pointed that Christ had to die and that even that Christ would r rise again from the dead. As he says here, that Christ should suffer, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead. He should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. That through Christ, salvation would come. Was Paul's message, and it ought to be our message today. Mm -hmm. Some may say, well, Christ wasn't the first person to be resurrected from the dead, but yet he was the first one to be resurrected unto eternal life, if you will. Right. Then all things he might have the preeminence that... He might be called the firstborn of the dead or the first fruits of the dead. Let's turn back to chapter 2 of Acts. We'll begin in verse 22. Acts 2, verse 22. Peter here is preaching to the Jews. It says, Ye men of Israel... Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved by God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Whom God hath raised up from or hath, excuse me, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. I said here. Paul, or excuse me, Peter says that Jesus Christ was a man approved of God. You know, he done miracles, wonders, and signs. But the Jews knew that. They had witnessed it. Yet they denied who he really was, didn't they? So verse 23 says, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel of God and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You know, it was that the foreordained plan of God for Christ to die. It always had been. As it's called here, the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. But yet, the Jews, they were still responsible, weren't they? <laughs> they were still responsible for killing really their king, the really God himself. He says, Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. If you remember back when the they were before Pilate, and they said, His blood be upon us. They were not ashamed of what they had did. The, the, think of the wickedness that must have been there that they would crucify the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet I think if he would come today, we would do the same to him. The world, by and large, would hate him, reject him, would want him put to death. Yet it was no accident that he died. It wasn't you know, plan B or plan C, as we saw before. <laughs> Yet as a lamb slain as from the foundation of the world, Christ had to die that he might redeem unto himself a people. Verse 24 says, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it is not possible that he should be holden of it. it was, he says it's not possible that Christ would have stayed dead. Right. Well, he would have been defeated if he had. The Bible says we would have been all men most miserable if it wasn't for the resurrection. 
You know, his death completed the sacrificial requirements, but really his resurrection completed all the rest of our redemption. The secured for us eternal life. He defeated death as well as the devil, as well as sin, as well as the grave. He defeated all of it <coughs> between his death and his resurrection. So Peter goes on in verse 25 to, to quote from Psalm 16. You know, verses 25 through 28 or from Psalm 16, 8 through 11 specifically. It says, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made me to know, thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with countenance. Amen. Here, David was not speaking of himself, but he was speaking of Christ. You know, the Old Testament saints knew that. Christ was coming. Right. You know, what, they didn't just. The Jews weren't caught by surprise when Christ showed up on the scene. You know, they weren't looking for the form necessarily, but right. not in the way they should have. But yet the scriptures over and over again pointed to him. The, the righteous, if you will, of the Old Testament, they knew he was coming. Abraham saw Christ's day and was rejoiced. I think what Christ himself said. David looked forward to Christ's coming, and throughout the Psalms you can see him foreshadowing Christ, prophesying of his coming. Verse 29 says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried in his sepulchers <laughs> with us unto this day. Here Peter is reinforcing the point that it, David wasn't speaking of himself. He said, David's still in the grave over there somewhere. He's both dead and buried in his sepulchers unto us, or is with us unto this day. I don't know if they knew where his sepulcher was, but apparently Peter said it was still there. Go on to verse 30 here. It says, Therefore, being a prophet, so he calls David a prophet, and certainly he shows himself over and over again to, to be one. And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruits of his loins, according to his flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Amen. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promises of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. Amen. David knew that God had promised that Christ would come, that Christ would even die and be resurrected, that Christ would one day sit upon his throne. As he says here, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. I think that's the problem. They were skipping the rest of it and just looking for that part, the Jews, <coughs> that is. But it says he's speaking of the resurrection of Christ, said that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. And Christ did not stay in the grave but for three days. As I've pointed out before, I think if he had stayed there four days, he would have been to see that corruption, that decay, if you will. Lazarus was dead four days, and they said, doesn't he stink? Right. This Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore we are all witnesses. God raised him up, he says. And all of them had been witnesses, both the Jews that were saved and some that perhaps didn't believe had seen him as after his resurrection. You have seen above 500 men, Paul says. But now he's ascended in the right hand of God. He's sat down at the right hand of God. 
and we know Stephen saw him there. Stephen saw him standing to welcome him home. And a few more verses here. It'll say that he has to stay there until all his enemies are defeated. Verse 34. In fact, here's where he goes on to say this. It says, For David is not ascended into heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Amen. Here's quoting from Psalms 110. wasn't that David was going to ascend into heaven and sit on the right hand of God, but Christ would. And Christ is currently. He says there, until, all, until I make thy foes thy footstool. You know, 1 Corinthians 15.25 says, until he puts all his enemies under his feet, the last enemy that shall be defeated is death. So death has been defeated for us, but it hasn't been completely destroyed yet. And I think it will be when cast in the lake of fire when death and hell were cast in the lake of fire this is the second death John wrote <laughs> therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ Amen. really what a damning accusation to the Israelites wasn't it that they had crucified the Lord and Christ that they had really killed their Messiah we could be most certain that he is Lord in Christ, that he is Master and Messiah, that he is the Supreme One and the Savior, that there is no other besides him, not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Allah, not Scientologist beliefs, not this modern Jesus that just tolerates everything and anything. But Jesus, the Son of God, the Jesus of the Bible, he is both Lord and Christ. And that's the other problem. Many people want him to be Savior, but not to be Lord, don't they? <laughs> Just save me from my sins, but I don't want anything you to tell me what to do after that. Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Verse 37 says, Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Notice here that they were pricked in their hearts. The word of God will do that to you, won't it? You know, uh, Hebrews describes as a two-edged sword piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints of marrow. The word of God will either harden your heart or soften your heart, won't it? Either when you hear the word of God preached, either you will be turned towards God or turned toward turns away from God, won't you? I don't know that any hear the preaching of the gospel and say, Oh, that didn't have any effect on me. But no they were preaching the heart and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? This is real conviction here, isn't it? It sounds much like what the Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? Well, the truth is we can't really do anything of our, in and of ourselves. But Yet he, Peter tells them what to do in verse 38. Then said Peter unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, us Baptists don't always like to touch on this verse because it talks about being baptized for the remission of sin. I think that's stretching the meaning of the verse. First, Peter tells him to repent. Repentance always accompanies salvation. <coughs> really, w without, I guess, knowing that you're in need of salvation, how will you cry out to him for it? Without seeing yourself as a sinner in need of a Savior, will you really cry out to be saved? I think. God reveals that you are wicked and sinful and in need of a Savior. Right. And that's really what I remember from my salvation is that God showed me I needed a Savior. Yeah. 
Yeah. I don't give thanks in order to receive the gift, <laughs> but I give thanks because you've already given it to me. So we get baptized <laughs> because our sins have already been remitted. Yeah, that goes along with my my next point is that belief always precedes baptism. Right. We see that very, very plainly in Acts eight, thirty six and thirty seven. <laughs> The Ethiopian eunuch said, "Well, here's water. What hinders? What doth hinder me to be baptized?" He said, "If thou believest, thou mayest." And certainly, I don't. You know, the Campbellites like to take that and say, "See here, you gotta be baptized to be saved." But no, there's plenty of examples of those who have been born again, even in the scriptures, who were not baptized. The thief on the cross, he is the perfect example of the grace of God and salvation. Right. There was another in the gospel, I forget, it was a woman, I forget exactly where it's at, that Christ himself said, Thy faith has saved thee. Well, baptism is important. Baptism should come shortly after salvation, I believe, but it does not put away the filth of the flesh, Peter says in his epistle. Baptism is a perfect picture of the death, of burial, and resurrection of Christ. Really, it's a, in a way, a good picture of our own salvation. I've been put away the old man and being raised to walk in the newness of life. Paul says, and "You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost," which we know. Really, the Holy Ghost had just come upon them as a body here earlier in this chapter. And empower them to do the work that they had been called to do. Right. So, does it so, so does the Holy Ghost come upon all those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Mm-hmm. Really, it's the Holy Ghost which convicts the heart, isn't it? It's the Holy Ghost which pricks the heart, as they says here. <laughs> really, our message should not be that much different than Peter, should it? Right. Just that. Preach Christ and Him alone, not that we must do good works, not that we must do this or that, but just simply repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, as it says in Acts 16. Amen. Whether we're using the Old Testament or the New Testament, we ought to be pointing to Christ. But as we see just very plainly in this passage, we can point to Christ in the Old Testament very easily. Mm-hmm. We don't think of that a lot of times, I don't think. We we get focused on you know, the New Testament, the Gospels, and Paul's writings, and there's a lot of good in those, don't get me wrong, but we can preach a lot of truth out of the Old Testament just the same. Mm-hmm. Say so Christ can be seen all throughout it. You know, I wouldn't have thought I could go to the first five chapters of Leviticus and really preach the Sacrifice of Christ as plainly as I do now after studying through this. <laughs> but oh, how our message ought to be the same. Preach Christ and his sacrifice. Preach him crucified and risen again. The doctrine's important, and I think we ought to preach that as well. But the lost, they need to hear just a simple gospel, if you will. <laughs> well, that's going to draw us to a close for tonight, I think. We uh, certainly could extend this class out much longer. <laughs> but we pray that you've been blessed by this. Amen. All right, if there's no other thoughts or comments, we'll close. All right. Well, thank you all.